Well, I mean, I, you know, Len and I kind of started it. Um, I mean, he was, he was working in anonymity and privacy. He was also running CodeCon, which was a, uh, which was a, a software conference in the Bay Area that ran back in the early 2000s. Um, I had actually uh, gone there to give a completely different talk about some bioinformatics stuff that I was doing in my internship. And then over lunch, I happened to tell him about the, uh, uh, about the, the SQL injection defense. I mean, basically the idea was, you know, another, another grad student had been telling me about how, you know, people try to defend against SQL injection with uh, regular expression-based whitelisting or blacklisting. And, you know, this guy mentions this and I'm like, that's silly because SQL is context free. So why would you try to, you know, why would you, why would you try to, to match it with regular expressions anyway? The pigeonhole principle says that's always going to be able to be tricked. Wouldn't you just come up with some way to do context free whitelisting? And, you know, the guy's like, what would that even look like? And I'm like, I can see it. I guess I'll just have to go write the code. So I did. Um, and then when I told Len about it, um, he realized that there was potential here for far more than just SQL. Um, so I ended up giving a talk about, uh, about that particular project called Dejector uh, at Black Hat in 2005. Um, and then, you know, for the next trick, uh, the following year uh, at Crypto, Daniel Bleckenbacher showed up uh, to the rump session with um, the, uh, the so-called E equals three padding forgery attack. Um, the idea there was that uh, you could forge um, PKCS1 signatures um, by um, basically adding a bunch of garbage onto the end of the signature um, because it turns out a lot of the uh, a lot of the tools that were supposed to be checking these signatures weren't actually checking that like the signature was the right length. They were just checking the value of it. Um, and as a result, um, you know, you, you, could, you could forge signatures this way. Um, so Bart Purnell comes up to me, you know, the next day and, you know, asks, can you, you know, can you do the same thing for PKCS1 that you did for SQL? I'm like, well, what does PKCS1 look like? And he sketches it out for me on the back of a napkin. I'm like, okay, that looks like it's context sensitive rather than context free, but I think I can do that. And then, you know, knocked it together that night in Bison. Yeah, I mean, it started out as, as mostly a defensive thing. And then in 2009, um, we realized that uh, we could actually use it adversarially as well. Um, that was when Len and Dan Kaminsky and I started forging SSL certificates, which uh, they gave a talk about that at, uh, at Black Hat and DEF CON that year. First and foremost, ambiguity is insecurity. I mean, if, if there's more than one way that, uh, the, that an expression can be interpreted, this is asking for trouble. Um, I mean, and you wouldn't, uh, the, the, this can sometimes also be the case if there's, uh, you know, if, if there's too many ways to express something. Um, you know, if you, if you think of domain-specific languages, you can think of X509 as a domain-specific language, right? And one of the ways that we forged SSL certs was actually through an integer overflow that um, CAs weren't really able to detect because um, the, the, because, um, the malicious part of the code was disguised as an arithmetic expression. Um, so the, the object ID for, uh, for uh, a common name in an SSL certificate is uh, 2.5.4.3. Well, so it turned out that um, in Crypto API, the Microsoft implementation, um, the, uh, uh, the type for integer was, you know, was 64 bits because 64 bits should be big enough for anybody, right? And what this means is that if you pass as an OID the arithmetic expression 2.5.4.2 to the 64th plus 3, 
The CA has no idea you know, what, that, what that giant number means. So it's perfectly happy to sign the certificate signing request and send you back a certificate for 2.5.4. giant number. Um, and then when Internet Explorer sees this certificate, uh, the giant number overflows and it sees 2.5.4.3. Oh gosh, well, I mean, in terms of the most, I'd have to say C. <laughs> yeah, I mean, C and, and C++ are, are, are foot guns waiting to be used. Um, I love Haskell. Um, lately, I've actually been using a tremendous amount of Kotlin, um, mainly because that's, uh, we're building an Android app at work. Um, but, you know, Kotlin is a very functional language. Um, that you know, works well on that platform. You know, it's JVM based, but uh, and and that certainly has its complications. But at least the JVM semantics are complete. Um, you know, unlike say ECMAScript, for instance, where there's like all kinds of undefined behavior running around. I'm a, I'm a big fan of virtualization. You know, the the more you can the more you can sandbox. Um, you know, the, the one thing to be concerned about there is, is how you're sandboxing, you know, because like we've, we've seen runtime rewriting type approaches that, uh, well, turns out you can trick rewriters sometimes. I mean, at some point, somebody was going to do a, you know, somebody was going to do a programmable, programmable smart contracts language. I mean, I think, I think the advent of Bitcoin made that inevitable. I mean, grid computing has been, you know, a thing people have been up to for, uh, I guess a couple decades now at this point. I mean, I took a grid computing class when I was in grad school. Um, and I mean, shit, we're even starting to see cryptocurrencies like th there's one, but there's one built on top of Boink, which is actually kind of bright. It's like, let's solve problems that are actually useful for people. Um, you know, so the, the, the whole notion of the, you know, the whole, the whole notion of a programmable blockchain, I think has a lot going for it. Contrary to, contrary to popular opinion, you can fix stupid, but you can't fix willfully ignorant. And I really don't get the impression that the, you know, that the mainline Ethereum developers are really all that interested in, in securing their platform. I mean, I think it's an attention issue. I think they're so, I think they're so fixated on you know, the profit potential of you know, sending this thing to the moon that they're not paying attention to you know, what's gonna happen when the O-ring shatters. <laughs>